the earth was formless and void, tohu wabohu, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. That's our subject matter today. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Tohu wabohu is a real interesting concept because it's associated with divine judgment. Divine judgment. So we've talked about, in fact, this is my eighth lesson on the gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Theological. There is a great theological gap between what was created in verse 1 and the condition of verse 2. Isaiah 45, 18 is one of those passages that remind us of that. So what we're going to talk about today is this concept of darkness over the surface of the deep. Last time, we studied uh, darkness that was associated with Satan. This darkness is associated with Satan. Like Colossians 1, 13, he, can, he rules over the domain of darkness in Colossians 1.13, or Acts 26.18. Uh, that's the idea. It's associated in verse 2 with the fall of Satan. And the word deep, the word deep in the English is the word, maybe your Bible might even say the abyss, and they would be right in the Greek language. So today we're going to look at the creation of the abyss. What is the abyss? What is, when he refers to the deep, what is he, I'm going to show it to you both in the Hebrew, tahum, which is a form of the word tohu. Tohu wabohu. This word in the Hebrew that the English translated deep is, and you'll see it on your paper in a moment, is tehum. And it's a form, it comes from the word Tohu in Hebrew. And so it's associated with divine judgment. This, this darkness is, Satan is known uh, for rulership over the domain of darkness. Well, look. Let me just remind you about Colossians a moment. This is one of many passages. It's the one I use a great deal. For he, Jesus Christ, rescues us from the domain of darkness. That's where all, all unbelievers are born to enter the world in the domain of darkness. He rescues us from the domain of darkness, which is controlled by Satan, and transfers us into the kingdom of the beloved Son, which is light. So that's, that's how that goes. And so we're going to look at that today. When is, in the Bible, when is the abyss identified? It's identified in verse 2. That word deep is the word for abyss. Okay? And so that's what our subject matter is going to be today. We are told in Genesis 1, 2, that the earth became, in, verse, in this verse, uh, became something it wasn't in verse 1. And you remember we, we talked about Lot's wife because the same form of the Hebrew word, uh, uh, William, would you, would you close the back door for me? It, thank you, William. It, what it says became, the earth became in one. Uh, the earth became something that wasn't like in Genesis 19.26, the same form of the word as a Cal Perfect is used about Lot's wife. Lot's wife became some, something she wasn't, remember? She became a what? Pillar of salt. Well, anyhow, that, that's the background to this. And so uh, in the Hebrew, 
when you have, and we've talked about this in, in Genesis 2, he outlines it, Moses outlines it in three points, and he uses the circumstantial wa. The three resulted uh, from the fall of Satan, theologically. He uses the circumstantial wa to give you three circumstances, one, two, and three. And, and, and here's how the list is translated and in the English. In the, it's a, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the, and the spirit was hovering over the water. What you actually have is the three ideas. One of those is darkness over the surface of the deep, which is the abyss in the Greek. In the Greek language, it is the word abyss, okay? And, and it's interesting because it says over the surface. In other words, darkness engulfed the abyss. And by the way, it still does. Darkness, that's satanic darkness, encompasses the abyss. So the question is, when did that, and that's, you're going to see today in our study that we're talking about a prison for fallen angels. There's no doubt about that. There's no question about it. We'll, we'll show it to you today. It'll take me seven points to get it all out, but we'll, that was what we'll do today. <clears throat> okay? Over, in other words, it's over the surface of the deep, it encompasses it. Okay? Darkness encompass the abyss. We will learn from our study in today's lesson that darkness over the surface of the abyss is a reference to the creation of the temporary prison of fallen angels and demons during human history. In other words, we know that there's a prison such as that. We see it in Revelation. When, when, it, when was it created? When was it established? It was established between one and two. It was established with the fall of Satan. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, 18 through 20, and Matthew 25, 41, now I'm going to, get, then I'm going to have a word of prayer and get in. Look, go to Matthew, because we'll get back to the other one. Matthew 25, 41. Okay, now we're in New Testament time. And Jesus says, then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You're going to find that we're talking, he's talking about the abyss. And he's talking also about the lake of fire. The abyss, the prison of fallen angels, one day they're going to be removed from there, go through a final judgment, and be cast into the lake of fire. Well, I'm going to get you. There. I'm, going to, I'm going to get you there. I'm just telling you where I'm take, going to take you. I'm going to take you and, and prove that all to you. We're, we're going to establish. I'm just telling you where we're going, and I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to walk you there. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to get, give you directions. I'm going to walk you there. So that, that's where we're headed today in our in our study. Um, I, I got seven points about this this concept. When did when did this prison of angels? When did it come into existence? And how long will it be there? And what's the final outcome? And what causes them to be put there? 
Do you realize at one point in the scriptures, Satan and all the fallen angels are going to be put there? Then they're going to be released for the final war of Gog and Magog. And then they're going to go through the fulfillment of the judgment of 2541 and be cast into the lake of fire. That's in Revelation 20. All of that. So we're looking from the, the front of that to the back of it. In Genesis, we're introduced to the idea. In, Je in Revelation 20, the conclusion of it. Here's where it was formed, and here's where the conclusion is. Genesis to Revelation. It is your entire Bible. Right? Genesis to Revelation. So it's just kind of interesting, and since this is my subject, and I'll probably never get back to this type the subject again with you. It's good that I walk you through it. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into this study, and we'll try to cover it in seven points so that you'll have something to look at and study. Let me remind you, in your bulletin, what do we do Tuesday? Well, we do have lunch. We do have Bible study lunch. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> and that's, that's, better, that's more important than anything, but then we also do what? We vote. You vote on Tuesday. If you don't like the prices of things and you don't like what's going on in America and you shouldn't, you go out and vote. It's not my place to tell you anything other than that, but you go vote. Before you go to vote, you do what? Be informed. Well, <laughs> be informed and be spiritual. Get prayed up and go in there and vote the way the Lord would tell you to vote. Okay? But we certainly need that. We certainly, so, so, and, and uh, does it report on Debbie? Yeah. She had COVID. Debbie Phillips, so we're. She's not back at work yet. Uh, I may go back uh, not, uh, Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's been on her feet and has to go to the grocery store. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Well, that's a good report. We can switch our prayer a little bit off into other areas of her life at this, this point then. Well, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege we have to. Work through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in prayer. According to your word, we ask according to your will. You hear us and you answer. We're thankful, Father, to know that not only do we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, we study the Bible and then apply it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't apply what we don't know, and so here we are at Bible study. Uh, do pray for our nation for our leadership from, from Moody to the state to the nation. Uh, we have strayed a long way from you. The church is vitally important to the recovery of the mess we have in America. There is nothing that the gospel of Jesus Christ can't put back into order. When a nation is in chaos or a church is in chaos or a life is in chaos, it's because of the influence of darkness or the devil over their life. And it's important that we walk in the light as we are light in him. So we lift our nation before you, Father, and pray that we would be good The church would be on top of their game in this hour of great darkness. The light can shine really bright. And so we pray for that. Pray for our service today. We thank you, Father, for the report we had on Debbie. We pray for others in our church that have needs, that during this prayer time, they're lifting them to you as well. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God in regards to the abyss. 
When was it created? Why was it created? What's the purpose of it? And when will it be done? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take a look at this under, I have seven points. I shouldn't have to explain to you in great detail what we're talking about when we talk about a domain of darkness. We've talked about that a great deal out of Colossians 1.13 and Acts 26.18. Point number one, the fallen angels of Genesis 6. This is really big now. The fallen angels of Genesis 6 revolted against the antediluvian civilization to attack the seed of the woman. This is not on your paper. To attack the seed of the woman of Genesis 3.15 that Paul declares in Galatians 3.16 is the Christ and known to us now as Jesus Christ, the historical humanity of the Messiah, right? What we have in point number one is that the fallen angels of Genesis 6 that cohabitated, cohabited, cohabited with the daughters of men of Genesis 6 was a revolt against the antediluvians. At least there are only three civilizations in human history according to the Bible. There's the antediluvian civilization, there's the post-diluvian, and then there's the millennial. And they're all three distinct in human history. The antediluvian goes from the fall of Adam to Noah's flood. The post-diluvian period picks up after the flood and takes us to the millennial period, the second coming of Christ, the establishment of the millennial kingdom of a thousand years puts us into a millennial civilization that's unlike any of the others. Okay? What the devil did in the antediluvian period is his strategy for the post-diluvian and the millennial. Except during the millennial period, the devil will not be on earth nor the fallen angels. They will be in the, in the abyss. They will be in the angelic prison in the heart of the earth. According to the Bible. His attack is always upon at the eternal life conference we learn when God laid the plan out God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, when they design what we call the plan of God recorded in the Word of God for human history, that part of it, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at that point, the Son of God would be the centerpiece of the plan of God. That He would be the visible manifestation of God and that he would be the object of worship equal with God. And Satan rebelled against that and let it revolt against the plan of God and he's been against it ever since. <clears throat> the last thing he wants you to go to Bible study and get is the plan of God. So, the plan of God is centered in the Messiah. So in the antediluvian period, he's out to destroy, in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman would be the savior of the world. Once he hears that, then he's out to destroy the seed of the woman, and he attacks the seed of the woman. That's what the whole angelic conflict in the antediluvian period was all about. That's what it was all about until Jesus Christ died on a cross, was buried, and raised from the dead. The attack upon the seed. Look at, he got Herod the Great to kill every male child under two to try to kill the Messiah. He 
thought he had a big win with the crucifixion, and then he discovered, oh my goodness, the church has been birthed, and everybody is a son of God. The birth of a large family of little Jesus is running around. What a mess. He cut off the head and it multiplied into unbelievable numbers. So he attacks the church today. And he's after the church to destroy because the church is producing all these little Jesuses. And so he's after the church, trying to destroy the church. This is, this is what his deal is about. Destroy the church. When the church is gone, then he's back to the millennial, he's back to the tribulational part of the final, the final goal round to try to dwarf the second coming of Christ. Listen, he's always a step behind God, and listen, you and God are always a step ahead of him. Why would you not walk in the power of the Holy Spirit to be, listen, when, when you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you're one step of, ahead of Jesus and uh, one step ahead of the devil, and Jesus is one step ahead of you. All right? So if you want to read about this attack upon the seed of the woman out of, Gen listen, you read Genesis 6 through chapter 9. Oh, I know that's a big read. But if you'll read Genesis 6 through 9, you'll see this whole story of the Andaluvian world in the angelic conflict. All right? The fallen angels of Genesis 6 revolted against the, the antediluvian civilization, attack upon the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. It resulted in the, the first group of fallen angels to be put in the angelic prison of the abyss located in the heart of the earth. You say, how do you know all that? Well, I'm going to give you all this. But then, yeah, I didn't make it up. I didn't make any of this up. Listen to 2 Peter 2 4. It's on your paper. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, which is Tartarus, which is a specific name for the prison. You know, prisons have specific names, right? We have one here in St. Clair County. Tartarus, cast them into hell, that's the English Tartarus, Tartarus, name of the angelic prison, that's the name of the prison, and committed them into pits, I gave you the Greek word, for caverns of darkness. And this word is a different concept of darkness. Zopas is thick darkness, like if you go down into the heart of a cave and you, you, and you turn off the light, you will, and, there, and, that, and you're still not in total darkness. But if this word is like that, right? I would never do that again. I did that once. I would never do that again. I would never do that again. Zopas is a darkness. They call it a thick darkness, and a darkness that you, you, you have a sense that you can feel it. It's thick. And that's the darkness of the abyss. That's the darkness of the abyss. Watch this. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus, 
and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. See, that reserved for judgment is Matthew 25, 41. That's a judgment that occurred at the Eternal Life Conference when they, when they sinned. He told them, he said, if you sin, you're going you're gonna to get whacked. He tells you ahead of time, if you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to go to this place. It, not this place, but you're going to go to a place called torment and wait the great white throne judgment. God doesn't go like, oh, well, you know, you should have known better. He tells you ahead of time. If, if God, if God said, any, said any day, time he would say, and you should have known better, it's because he told you, and 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 told you, and told you. All right, here's Jude 6. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, they cohabited with the daughters of men, he has kept in eternal bonds, chains, under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That's going to come in Revelation 20. I got one more for you. Write this down. First Peter, third chapter, 18 through 20. For Christ died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which also he went, and proclaim to the spirits now in prison. He's talking, about, he's talking about these fallen angels of Genesis 6. Look at verse 20. Who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, so we know when this happened, during the construction of the ark, in which, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the waters. Do you see that? So we don't have to guess on what he's talking about, do we? There's no guess to this. You put these three passages together, and you've got a good look. Right? Did you write down 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20? Because I didn't put it on your paper. I don't put everything on your paper. You've got to be a student. At some point, you've got to take responsibility for your own growth. You know? This, this cavern of dark, thick blackness, this cavern of dark, thick... It, that, when I hear them talk about the outer space and these black holes, are you familiar with that? They, they refer to black holes... That's kind of what I think about when I hear that. I kind of think about this deal. Here's point number two. Jesus prophesied that he would be buried in Sheol, which is the Hebrew word, which in Greek is called Hades, and in English we call hell. You got to really be careful with the English because they just call everything hell, and that 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 don't tell you anything. When when they're talking about Sheol, they're talking about one place that has three divisions in it, three compartments in the heart of the earth. One compartment is called paradise, where prior to the the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, where he ascends back to the Father. Prior to that, when a believer died, he went to paradise, also known as Abraham's bosom. You can read about that in Luke 16 if you're interested. That's one compartment. There's another compartment called torment, where the unbeliever went. 
when he died. In Luke 16, Jesus gives an understanding of it that the people in paradise and the, the paradise and the unbelievers, a gulf separated them, and apparently there was awareness of the two existence of these two places. For the rich man died and, and went to the place of torment and had a conversation with Abraham in paradise about Lazarus, the poor man who died and went to paradise. Well, was, I mean, you, know, you can read Luke 16 and get it. Here's the interesting thing about that. Because I'm on Tuesday, I'm doing studies of parables of Jesus out of Luke. All my parables out of Luke that we're studying. Luke 16, by almost all conservative theolo theolo theologians, don't believe Luke 16 is a parable, a literal parable. You know why? Because he names the poor man, Lazarus, that died and went to paradise, he named a name. You don't find that in parables. He doesn't do that in parables. So while we look at that, and it kind of looks like a parable, and people consider it to be one, you have a name of a person. The, the rich man was, didn't have a name. But the poor man who died and went to paradise is called Lazarus, not the Lazarus of the two, the two sisters. So the, apparently it's a common name like John or Bill or Joe of the day. So it's an interesting read out of Luke 16 if you're interested. Jesus prophesied that he, when he died, his body would go to the grave, and his soul, listen to me, when Jesus died on the cross, his body went to the grave. It had to go to the grave a specific way according to prophecy, or he, it would disqualify him. Just think about that. His spirit went back to the Father who had given it to him, and it had to be done a specific way for him to qualify to be the Savior. Did you know that? These things are found in, in the Psalms. And his, show, his soul has to go to Sheol. And he has to be there for three days and three nights. Did you know that? Sheol has a, a compartment or a division that's called paradise or Abraham's bosom where believers went. It has another place called torment where the unbeliever, the unbeliever still goes there. The believer no longer goes to, goes to Sheol. The believer, the believer today doesn't go down, he goes up. Oh, we'll, we'll see that. I'll give you a scripture on it. There's a third compartment called the abyss. It's called, the prison is called Tartarus. And that's where angel, fallen angels go. And they're kept in this prison. All of those who were involved in a revolt of the anti-believing world, you want to read about them? Read Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, listen to me, and Revelation 9. Because they're talked about there. You, you, look. You probably have to hear this stuff about 10 times to get it. Because you go, I've never, the first time you hear it, you go like, I've never heard that before. So you've lost that lesson. 
then you stagger back to your feet, you hear it a second time, you go like, well, I listened a bit. You, about 10 times later, you got it. Just because you have to battle through, well, who says that's that way? That's why I document everything. Well, Ron says, look, I don't, look, I give you scripture. I give you scripture. I don't give you a sermon. I give you scripture. I don't come up with something on my own. All right? Jesus prophesied that he would be buried in Sheol, called Hades, also called hell, in, in, in a broad sense of where it is. Three days and three nights, and then he would be raised from the dead. Matthew 12, 38 through 40. In Matthew 12, 38 through 40, he says he's going to, he, he says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried for three days and three nights in Sheol. And he calls it, you know, like Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster, that he was going to be, instead of the sea monster, I'm going, listen, he's, he says, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth, the heart of the earth, planet earth, for three days and three nights. In Acts 2, 27 and 31, there's a prophecy given out of Psalm 1610 that God had promised in the word of God, Psalm 1610, that he would not abandon his son's soul to Hades, nor allow when his soul comes back to his body, to, that his body would be decayed. There would be no decay. We know from Scripture, because of La the Lazarus who had the two sisters and died, after four days the body, what? Stinketh. So Jesus is going to be, listen, all of this, you think God's not ahead of the game? Listen, he's so far ahead of, of where you are, you need to start trusting him. You're worried about tomorrow, and he's got, listen, he's on the day after tomorrow for sure. You're worried about tomorrow, and he's so far down the pike for you. Just relax and trust God to move you along the path. He's got it all covered. Just trust him. Why is that so hard? You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor my flesh for decay. All right? That's Psalm 1610. That's a prophecy. In Matthew 12, 38 through 40, Jesus tells us that Sheol is located in the heart of the earth. Paul, when he teaches on Sheol, he says in Philippians 2.10, it's under the earth. You know, the name that is above every name, that's where that's found. You know, the name that's above every name, right? See, you forget that he said under the earth. Paul again taught on Sheol in Ephesians 4, 9 and said it's in the lower part of the earth. If you want to know where Sheol is. And Sheol is the big name that describes one compartment within there is called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Another is called torment where the unbeliever goes. And the other is called Tartarus, the bottomless pit or the abyss. I read to you 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20, in which his burial, he, Jesus Christ, went and made proclamation. Now, this is really interesting. He made a proclamation. This is not the word. If your Bible says preach, this is not the word. He did not go down there and evangelize. He did not go down there and preach. He went down there and made a public proclamation to the fallen angels of Genesis 6 with a decree from God Almighty. A public proclamation is somebody that goes out and speaks the decree from the king. When he went down, 
he went down during that three days and three nights he went down and made a public proclamation to the fallen angels. That's what he says in 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20, in which also he, Jesus, went and made a proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the waters. Got that? Got that? Yes. You really have to understand the three civilizations and Satan's attack. And the only one that he doesn't get a chance to attack until the end of it is a millennium because at the second coming of Christ, one of the things Christ is going to do following the tribulation is to send him and the fallen angels into the pit. And they're going to be there for a thousand years. At the close to the end of that thousand year reign of the millennium, they're going to be released and once again cause havoc on the earth and there's going to be the great war of Gog and Magog. And when that war's over, he's going to be cast along with the fallen angels and fulfill Matthew 25, 41. And he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And we, as far as I know, we don't know where that is. Okay? You get a picture of this? But how, far, how far is God out ahead of you? Wrong way. And yet God cares about your, your specific walk. He cares where you are on Sunday and Monday, and he even cares what period you're in on Monday and how your walk is going. Think about that. Is your Heavenly Father not wonderful? Your Heavenly Father cares about you. He is your Abba Father. And when you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, God adopts you into his royal family. You will be a child of his forever, and he cares dearly about you. I hope you know that. Point number three. Jesus completed a full, full mission to Sheol. Remember, that's the big picture. He completed a full, full, when he went to Sheol, there were four things he had to get done. One, he had to meet with the thief on the cross. Agreed? Yeah. Luke 23, 43. Today you will be with me in where? Paradise. Secondly, he's going to make a proclamation. He's going to decree something from God Almighty that's important to these angels of the revolt of Genesis 6 through 9. He's going to make a proclamation to the fallen angels in Tartarus. You understand that? I just gave you these, all these points with Scripture. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Now watch this. The third thing that Jesus did before he left, he closed the door to paradise. He shut the door to paradise in Sheol and opened the door of paradise to heaven. Now think about that. You understand that? Because when you die, you go to the third heaven. When you die, you go up, you don't go down. Huh? Well, let's go to, let's, uh, this is for you, so you need to get this down. This is your obituary. 
2 Corinthians this is what I'll talk about at your funeral. Therefore, being always of good courage, I mean 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7 and 8. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For now we walk by faith and not by sight. But be of good courage, I say to you, and prefer rather to be absent from this body and to be at home with the Lord. Where's the Lord? He's in the third heaven. See the right hand of God the Father with authority. Agree? Watch this. Still 2 Corinthians, go to the 12th chapter. Paul makes a statement. Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. I will want to talk about visions and revelations of the Lord with you. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I'm not, I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Third heaven. Uh -huh. That's where you go. I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. And then he goes on and talks about it. Paul went there. Uh, on his mission, one of his missionary trips, early on, he got stoned to death. He wasn't sure if he died or, or not, but he was sure of this. He had a revelation. See, he told you that. I had a revelation, and I can only share part of it with you. And to make sure he can only share a part of it with you and not all that he saw or heard, God put a thorn in the flesh on him so that he would never reveal what he had seen. And he goes on to talk about it. What's my point? My point is that when you and I die, we go up. We, 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 we go to the third heaven to be with the Lord. And listen, it's instantaneous. Now, I haven't been there. I'm just talking Paul has. It's instantaneous. One moment, one moment, you're being stoned, and next minute you're standing in the presence of the Lord. And Paul went, well, that wasn't bad. I mean, first couple, first couple of stones, I went like, ooh, this is a bad day. And the next thing I know, I'm standing in the presence of the Lord. I don't know if I died or not. I don't know if this is a dream or if I actually died. Do you know what just Paul said about dying? Did you get it? He don't even, in this passage, we know from Acts where it occurred, but he don't even talk about being stoned, does he? Because it was a blip and he was in the presence of the Lord. So I love that. If, you, if, you're, if, if you're fearing dying, I don't care what, the guy walks up and says, well, I'm going to shoot you, or I'm going to take cut off your head like they did Paul, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. So what? It will be nothing. It will be nothing. You won't even, you can't, you won't even remember. What was it? What, now, well, a bunch of people tried to stone me. What, 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 but, I don't even remember that part. I just remember, boom, there I am in the presence of the Lord. You know why you have that confidence? Is because Jesus died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead to give it to you. He was raised from the place of death. Right? Right? Three days and three nights in the place of death. That was associated with his crucifixion. 
You see, he died on that cross, but he's not through with death until he's raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. So he closed the door to paradise going down, and he opened the door to paradise of heaven through his resurrection. He was also given the keys to Tartarus, the abyss, the bottomless pit. He talks about it in Revelation 118. It's talked about again in the ninth chapter, verse 1, and the 20th chapter, verse 1. Let me show you this, and we'll take a break. Let me go to the book of Revelation. And here's 118. And we follow the keys, we know who gets them. 118. In verse 17, he says, Do not be afraid. I am Alpha and Omega. And the first and the last, right, Greek students? I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. You got that? All right. Let's go to the ninth chapter where we've got these fallen angels of Genesis 6. Just kind of scanning through this, looking at specific information. Now we're in the, the, the fifth angel sounded, this is trumpets, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up out of the pit and the smoke of the great man. He goes on and talks about it. Look down in verse 11. It talks about the king of the revolt, the, the head angel, the five-star general that ran the program of Genesis, 6, of Genesis 6 through 9. He's got a name. They had a king over them these angels. They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew was Abaddon, and his name in Greek was Apollon. Both words mean destruction, by the way, destroyer. The first woe was passed, and the second woe, according to Revelation, is on the way. Then we go to, well, 20th chapter, just stand with the key idea a little bit. 20th chapter, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. That's an authority. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. How about that? Paul asked a question in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 7. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. You know what the answer is? But could you prove it? So you ought to write this on your paper because you think you could probably answer that. You may not have the scriptures to proof it. You ought to put down Romans 8, 9 through 11 because there's your answer. You know who went, reached down into the depths and raised them up from the dead? Do you know who that is? Who did that? The Holy Spirit of God. Verse 11, the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside your mortal body. Think about that. And Paul goes on to talk about that in chapter 10. Romans 9, 11 
if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if that's true, see, that's the if part of a first-class condition. If that's true, then the then part is true. Are you with me? That's a first-class condition. If the spirit of him, that's the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, not in your paper. He who raised, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is who? The Holy Spirit, right? Will also give life, the spiritual life, that's eternal life, a life that goes from now forever to your mortal body through the Spirit who indwells you. Isn't that powerful? Listen, not only does he give you eternal life, but he brings eternal life out, out of you like John 10.10. 10. See, it's one thing for you to believe that you have eternal life, and that's a marvelous, wonderful thing to believe. You have eternal life, and you can never lose it. But what you might be missing is that life in you wants to come out of you. That spiritual life of God that's in you, eternal life that's in you, wants to come and produce an abundant spiritual life from you. And that's what's important to you. Yes, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. But listen, you're going to miss all the joy of the journey by not living in the power of the dynamics of the Holy Spirit now in your life. The Holy Spirit dwells in you and has brought life to your mortal, your dying body. You do know that every time you age, you're getting closer to the grave, not to birth. You're moving further away from birth and closer to the grave. That's the human side of it, the divine side of it. You're actually growing younger and stronger in the Lord the closer you get to the grave. How about that? You've been born again, and that born again spirit in you, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, wants to bring the fullness of God's life out of you while your feet are on earth. And so he tells you, I want you to walk in the power of the Spirit and not in the, in the weakness of the flesh. I want you to live in the power of faith and not in the weakness of sight. Point number four, Jesus taught that the abyss was the prison of demons during the church age. Probably one of the most famous stories of demons in the church age was the demoniac of Luke 8, uh, 26 through 39. And uh, they confronted uh, Jesus. What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Which is probably, that's not a, probably a very big term for us in the church age, as big as it was for this age of Christ, when he came into the world and the demonic world, the demonic world had a view of God that probably most of us don't pay that much attention. For example, for me, for me I, I, the fact that God is my Abba Father just dominates my life. When I picture God in my heart, the fact that I'm his child and I'll always be his child through the grace given to me through the gospel of Christ, the fact that he's my Abba Father means more to me than any title you could give to me in regard to God. That's a, a very strong, the fact that I can call God my daddy um, and have access to him at any time is just an enormous idea to me. But for the angelic world, when they referred to Jesus as the most, 
the son of the most high God, you're talking about a title reference that goes all the way back to the Eternal Life Conference. Where Jesus is declared the son of the most high God. And it caused a rebellion. It caused a rebellion. Well, that's the kind of stuff that, that clicks in my soul when I hear this. So the demoniac said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. And he's talking about Matthew 25, 41. He's not, not talking about like people having emotional issues or, or, or verbal jawing. I mean, he's talking about torment, eternal torment. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Right? What is your name? And he said, Legion. Which is several hundred, isn't it? In one guy. Several hundred in one person. We're talking about hundreds. And there's a lot of debate that goes on back and forth about, you know, how many, I don't know why that, that was. Apparently Rome, Rome had a different, I don't know, but I mean, they usually talk about 600 in a legion or something, but there's, there's controversy about how many were in a legion, but we're, we're talking about hundreds. When he says, my name is legion, I guess we, we all assume that he's talking about a legion, a Roman legion. That's what we all assume. If there's something else, I don't know about it. Uh, For many demons had entered him, and they were entreating him not to command them to depart into the abyss. So you see, they know what tormenting is. They don't, they don't want to go into the abyss. So the question comes theologically up, who are demons? And here's what they are. After the, after the antediluvian world, the angels, the fallen angels who went into the post-diluvian period were, in theology, disembodied spirits so that they could not do what they did in the antediluvian period by leaving their own domain, by leaving their own mode, uh, like like Peter talked about. And so, the, all they can do, these are fallen angels in the post diluvian period. They're called demons, they're disembodied spirits, and listen, if a legion, a Roman legion is 600, and it varies, but we're in the hundreds are in this one man. And it, he was very famous in the culture that day. You know, this is a guy in the graveyard and all that business. Demon possession, not of believers now. A demon cannot indwell in a, a, a believer because the Holy Spirit takes up the space. The indwelling in the Holy Spirit, you can't do that. But an unbeliever can be possessed and could be possessed by a lot of spirits, demonic spirits. Well, anyhow, I mean, this is, this, and listen, boy, the devil was ranching it up when he realized that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Son of God business. He really got after it. And uh, you know, the, the, the disciples, when they were sent out missions, could cast out demons, couldn't they? Sometimes. It depended how many was in them. They came back and they, they got beat up pretty good. And the sons of Sebas and Adam, I we were casting out demons to showtime, the little circus deal. Then they ran up against the, the real deal and they couldn't do it. 
and the demons jumped out and beat him up. It's an interesting story. I don't know how all that works, but it's an interesting story. <laughs> and anyhow. All right, so we, that's what we have going on in the church age. I traveled all over the United States when I was with Graham. And I was not aware of the culture I came from in Michigan. I wasn't, a, I wasn't aware if there were demon possession. I just sure didn't know it. There was, and I couldn't find, I didn't find it in the South. But I'll tell you, I found it in a whole lot of places, other places. I found demon possession in a whole lot of different places. And I'll tell you one place I found a great deal of it was in Louisiana. And especially the New Orleans area that was heavily engaged in witchcraft and all kinds of stuff. Wow, I found it there. And I found it on the West Coast. <laughs> I think it's grown since I was there. I was in a meeting. I was a meeting in California. Uh, the Presbyterians had, had invited me out to do a, I, annually, I went out there every summer and did a, a two-week conference with the Presbyterians in uh, San Diego. And, you know, it's a wonderful thing about my background. I don't know anything about denominations. <laughs> so when somebody asks me to come speak, I just go speak. Not knowing that I might offend somebody by telling them the truth. I don't even think that way. But these people, uh, they, they, and so I stirred up a horn and the first year, but they invited me back, and I went, and I didn't know what it was all about. The fussing was all about. About my third year out there, I had a couple. He was a lawyer out there. He came to me, and he had a private conversation with he, his wife. They had one daughter, and it, 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 she was bananas in their terms. And uh, they'd have they just spent all kinds of money on her, trying to get her well, mentally. And they ask if I would come out and take a look at her. Well, what do I know? I thought, well, I go out and have prayer with the family and kind of put them at ease. If, if I'd ne I never personally encountered a demon. I'd seen a lot of activity down in Louisiana, though. I went, well, this is scary stuff right here. And I encountered one in that girl, okay? And I'll tell you, that was really something. But I knew the power in me was greater than the power in her. Now, the reason her parents asked me to come, they didn't tell me until after the meeting I had with the girl. And they said, what do you think? And I said, she's demon-possessed. I saw it at Bryce's. I used to, when I was in my senior year, I did some work in Bryce working on a paper. I didn't know what it was then. But I came back to my professors and I said, you know what? Phew. I think there's there that they never would let anybody into that's demonic. And, they, and I think so too. But she had she had a special dog, the, the therapy kind of dog that was really good with her and she killed it. She killed the dog. I don't want to talk about it, but she did it. She, it wasn't a normal death. She, more like sacrifice. And was talking about getting her parents, killing her parents. So they got, they, 
they told me that after I interviewed her. <laughs> that would have been nice to know that ahead of time. I probably wouldn't have went on that journey. Um, so anyhow, you know, all I did was give her the gospel. What, what else could I get? I, I didn't know how to cast out demons. What would I do and cast out demons? They'd jump on me. <laughs> I was over my head. I knew I had, I had a power over them. They didn't have a power over me. I told them straight up and straight out. But I didn't know. I, could, I didn't perform an exorcist or anything. But I did give her the gospel. I told them, I said, you know, you have to be quiet. Well, you have to be quiet. Well, I speak in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm giving her the gospel. You be quiet. And it was she was quiet. I don't know whatever happened to her. Uh, are they around? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't get crazy with it now because they, there's a lot of, <laughs> don't get crazy with this. Say, I got a couple of, I'm not coming to visit. I am done with that. I send everybody to hell now. I don't do any of that. Point number five, in the middle of the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, the fallen angel, hey, you know what, Rick? You want to you really pay attention overseas in Africa to that. That's a heads up for you. I don't know if you've encountered it. Jackie, have you, you guys encountered that? Yes. I mean, boy, the missionaries talk about it. There in Mexico, the missionaries I talk out of Mexico and, and parts of Africa, I mean, they, they, they talk in glowing terms. I mean, they, I went, phew. L listen, to, listen to Revelation 9. I'm just calling a few th things out. The fallen age of Genesis 6 will be released from the abyss, the bottomless pit, back to earth during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. That's Revelation 9, 1 through, you know, you can read the whole chapter of, 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 of 9. Also, the 11th chapter, verse 7, and the 17th chapter, verse 8, is a good read. In the ninth chapter 1 and 2, I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth and the, key of the bot and, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him and he opened the bottomless pit. And we're, they're released during the last three and a half years of the tribulation on earth. That's, listen, boy, that's a, that was quite a fighting unit too, wasn't it? They got a whole civilization. That's quite a fighting unit. You know, if you look at Ephesians uh, 6, chapter 10 through 17, you have to put on the full armor of God. I mean, you need the full armor of God. Listen, you battle the demonic world. You need the full armor of God every day of your life. And boy, if you can't see it in, the, in America today, they had a king in the ninth chapter, verse 11, we talked about this, and, they have a, and he has a name. The king of the fallen angels, that... That'd be like a five-star general. Point number six, following the tribulation and the war of Armageddon, Satan and all the fallen angels will be put in the abyss for a thousand years of the millennial period, Revelation 21 through 3. That's the angelic prison. And listen, you know what's interesting to me? When Jesus went down there, he made a proclamation to a king. He decreed some things to them from God. I mean, he carried a message, just like I am, to you. But he carried a message to them that had meaning to them and where they were in human history and laid it out on them. Isn't that interesting? And beyond that, I don't know what all he said to him. But he made a public proclamation from an authority greater than him and greater in the sense of the plan of God and greater than them in this proclamation. That's really interesting to me. And the more I study theology, the more interesting it gets. Uh, here's Revelation 21 through 3. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss. 
a great change as an authority. In his hand, he laid hold of the dragon called the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Notice the three names. The dragon, the serpent of old is one. And bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. That's, the, that's towards the end of the millennial age. And then Satan in Matthew 25, 41 will get his final judgment. Satan and the fallen angels. Remember this passage. It's Matthew 25, 41. It says Satan, that sentence that was given him for his revolt against heaven will be against him and the fallen angels. It says in Matthew 25, 41, him and the angel, his angels. Remember that. Because I often I'll say, they'll say, well, I read Revelation and I don't see, it says Satan was cast, but it doesn't. Well, Matthew 25, 41 is where it was instituted. It says Satan and his angels. Now let me close. Following the millennial, uh, the millennium and the war of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium, Satan and all the fallen angels will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. Listen to this. I'm in Revelation again. The 20th chapter. Watch this. Here's how this thing's going to end. When the thousand, I'm in Revelation 27. When the thousand years are completed, that's the millennial period, Satan will be released from his prison towards the end of it. Will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sands of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. I had a guy in my church, a very good engineer, that wrote a paper on brimstone that was out of sight. He went back and did an enormous study on that. I'd never seen anything like that. Thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, for him, it, it, this is eternity, and it caught him, I mean, just as an engineer, he just went, crazy with this idea where the beast and the false prophets are also that's in chapter 19 and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and I have I have not been able to find any any evidence of where the lake of fire is uh, I can't if, it's, if there's some evidence of it in the Bible, I haven't been able to find it yet. So I don't know where that is. I don't know where that part, I don't know where that is. I know they will be cast there forever and ever. And so I, I personally don't know where that is. Uh, I, I don't have any clue on it. Uh, but it too has been designed for that heaven. All the way back in eternity past, that thing was also designed, Matthew 25, 41. That's the end of Matthew 25, 41. They will be cast into the lake of fire. That's the fire business. Well, I've got one more study to do with you before I get into creation. <laughs> that's all connected with verses 1 and 2, and that's the angelic conflict. I mean, you... Now you're ready for me to teach you the angelic conflict, in my opinion. There, there, there are certain things that have to be staged in order for you to really get the picture of the angelic conflict and the war that you and I fight. The war that you and I fight, and it's an important war 
in the church age. Every generation has to fight a war successfully in the church age. Every generation has to fight it. You, we're in our generation to fight the angelic conflict. So when we come back the next time, I'm going to uh, do a study uh, with you on the angelic conflict so that you can t tie all these together uh, so that... It, well, let's have a word of prayer. Well, Father, what have we learned today? Wow. We've learned that you're in control. Nothing, nothing occurs without you signing off on it. We also know, Father, that you're a God of order. And when there's chaos, it's the absence of the authority of God. Whether it's in our personal life, in our community, in our church, in our nation, if there's chaos, it's of the devil. Order is of God. Chaos is of the devil. If it's truth, God stands. If it's a lie, the devil stands. If it's darkness, it's the devil. If it's light, it's God. I mean, it shouldn't be hard for us to see the distinguishing marks, the difference between light and darkness, the difference between death and life. The, these differences, Father, they should be clear to us. And what they show is that we are in the angelic conflict of the last days. We're in a we're in the last days of human history with an open end. Once Christ comes for the church, we will be in a countdown. We're in the last days without an end in sight. We don't have a okay, it's you know, in the six hundredth year. We don't have any of that. And I love that because, God, it's your desire that none perish. And so if there's somebody here today that has never understood why Christ came into the world for them personally, he dies on a cross to take our sins upon him, our sins personally. He dies for them so that they would never have to pay the penalty for their sin. Christ paid it for them. I'm so thankful you did that for me. I want them to know today that you've done that for them. You've taken all their sins away, and all they, what they have to do is understand that he died on the cross for their sins. And when they believe that that sin is dealt with, and that death is no longer hanging over their heads, because when they leave life, they, they go from life to life because they have eternal life. Because God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. We go from life to life. I pray for that person today that's never really understood that. And what do, what do they have to do to be saved? They have to believe that. They don't run through loops. They don't do laps around the church. Three laps and you're saved. No. When you believe it, you receive it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I pray that over any person here today that needs to do this, both in the congregation, and on the internet. In Jesus' name, amen.